Thank you, Gina, and thank you all for joining us for the ACRL's Instruction Sec Section 2019 ALA Midwinter Virtual Discussion. I am Lauren Hayes, the Chair of the Discussion Group Steering Committee. Today's virtual discussion is titled, Make Small Changes, Get Inclusive Results, Bringing Universal Design into Library Instruction. The discussion conveners today are Samantha Cook, Instructional Design Librarian, and Christina Clemente, Student Success Librarian, both of the University of Wyoming. Samantha Cook is the Instructional Design Librarian for the University of Wyoming's Libraries. Samantha received her Bachelor's in History from the University of Wyoming and Master's of Science in Information Studies from the University of Texas. Her current research projects are Universal Design Learning and Library Instruction, Invisible Disabilities in the Academic Library, and Open Educational Resources. Christina Clement is the Student Success Librarian for the University of Wyoming Libraries. Christina received her bachelor's in the Italian language from the University of Kansas, a master's in Italian literature from the University of Notre Dame, and a master's in, of information science from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Her current research projects are customer service motivation in academic libraries, library space and instructional assessment, and open educational resources. I will now turn it over to them. So hi, I'm Sammy. And I'm Christina. And um, if, if your video, if you can see our video, hi, this is us. Uh, we are going to turn it off for most of the presentation. Yes. Yeah. Um, so our contact information is here and we will share it many times throughout. Again, uh, for all comments, please do the panelists and attendees. Um, and if we don't get to your comment, but you have a question, please email us. Um, we will pre be presenting most of this and going back and forth. Um, quite a bit. So thank you guys for joining us today. All right, so there are several ways that you can participate um, in the discussion today. Okay, so Sorry, I had to stop our video. Um, so like we've mentioned, the Zoom chat is going to be the easiest way uh, for you to contribute to this discussion. So you can type in your question or comment and we're going to try to respond to as many as we can. Um, if you have additional questions you either don't want to put in the chat or if we don't get to your question or comment, you can email us um, at scook13 at uio.edu or kclemen8 at uio.edu. And those emails will be popping up throughout the presentation, but you might want to write them down right now. Um, we also, it's just right here. We also have a Google folder that we are providing for you guys. Um, it looks like this. It's got four files in it. So we have um, our detailed outline. Uh, we have a collaborative note taking document where if you want, you all can take collaborative notes or you can make a copy of it and take your private notes. And then we've also provided a UDL chart with library instruction examples, uh, which we're going to go over later. It just looks a little nicer in the, the Google Doc. Uh, rather than trying to copy that onto our slides. And then we've also provided the slides of the presentation if you want to follow along that way or look at it later. And then we also want to keep the conversation going um, on Twitter. So we made a new hashtag. It's UDL in libraries. And as far as we can tell, no one's hashtagging that. Um, so you can tweet additional questions and comments at us um, at Sammy underscore librarian or at KC underscore librarian one. Um, we also know that a lot of people are probably watching as groups. So if you guys have any really good discussion within your groups that doesn't make it into the chat box, try and tweet about it because we want to know what you have to say. So um, a couple things that we want to note before we get started. First of all, UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning, which is what we are focusing on today. And we're mostly going to be using the abbreviation throughout the presentation. Um, we also want to note that we're going to do our best to stick to person first language. Since UDL involves persons with disabilities, we have made the choice to identify the person first rather than the disability. So for example, we will do our best to say a person who is autistic rather than an autistic person. Uh, we also encourage participants to use this type of language in your questions or comments unless you personally identify a different way and then that's fine. 
And then lastly, um, we are quite aware that there are parts of this topic that could lead to some very passionate discussion and opinions. And we want you all to know that we are respectful of all opinions and we ask that everyone today exercise civil and collegial discourse um, in our discussion. So, but first, before we get started, we want to do a little bit of polling. So we're gonna hop over here to Mentimeter. And if you've never used Mentimeter before, it's really easy, you just have to open up a browser, uh, either on your computer or your phone, type in www.menti.com and type in that code 56625 and then you should be able to see uh, this question and you can send in some answers. So we want to know what comes to mind when you think of library instruction and accessibility. So we're going to generate a word cloud. Uh, you should be able to put in up to about 10 words. So yeah, let's start sending in words. And if someone is sending in the same word that you thought of, send it in again. Um, it's really great because the words will start to get bigger, as you can see. So we're gonna let you send in words for about 20 or 30 more seconds. And we are actually gonna tweet the final word clouds and other polling stuff after uh, the session. So don't worry about trying to screen grab this. We'll, uh, we'll put it out there and we'll include it in um, the Google Drive folder as well. So cool, you guys. So cool. Wow. All right. Looks like we're getting a lot of responses, which is really great. Um, okay, you've got five more seconds to send in any last words that you want because we do need to move to our next question. That's so cool. All right, so we're gonna to move to our next question. Keep this great. So our next question we wanna know, and it should change on your screen, is have you ever had an accommodation request in your library instruction? Just simple, yes or no. If you don't know, you can either choose not to respond or I would, I would tend towards no. All right, I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds. You wanna send in an answer. All right, so I hope you got a chance to send it in. If you didn't, that's okay, but we're gonna to move to our next one. So did you feel prepared to adjust your instruction to fit the accommodation? Just yes or no. And we have a question from the chat from Kenneth. Um, the code to use for sending in an answer, all you have to do is go to menti.com and it should prompt you to put in a code. The code is 56625. It's right at the top of uh, where you should be seeing our screen share. All right, cool. Well, we're going to move to the next one. It looks like we're actually pretty even. We weren't really sure what kind of response we would get. So, um, and we'll dig into some of this a little bit later. Okay, so have you ever intentionally incorporated UDL, Universal Design for Learning, in your library instruction? If you haven't, it's perfectly okay. And we also encourage participants to converse with each other in the chat. Um, we're monitoring it as best we can, um, but you feel free to talk to each other. This is a big discussion. All right, so it's looking like a majority um, has not intentionally incorporated it. That doesn't mean you aren't incorporating it, it just wasn't necessarily on your mind. Okay. All right, we're gonna go back to our presentation. Do please keep that um, Menti screen open. We're gonna come back to this at the end of our presentation because we have a couple more questions for you. So um, try not to close it. If you do, that's okay. But um, the easiest thing is just to leave it open. All right, so now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of this. And so the number of people with disabilities has been steadily rising every year. The US Census data shows 
that this number has risen from 11.9% in 2010 to 12.7% in 2017. This gradual increase in the number of people with dis dis disabilities means that colleges and universities are enrolling more students with a wide variety of disabilities that may affect learning styles and capabilities. Unfortunately, we were unable to find current data about the number of students with disabilities in a university setting, but these numbers are from 2011 to 2012 and are probably the most current, and hopefully they'll update these. So these numbers show that 11% of enrolled undergraduates identify as having a disability. 21% of enrolled undergraduates were veterans identifying as having a disability, and 44% of undergraduates with disabilities went to a four-year university, and 46% went to a two-year. This means that on average, one out of every 10 students potentially has a disability according to 2012, which we know could potentially be more as the number of people with disabilities are rising. Something that is important, especially as someone myself with an invisible disability, is realizing that sometimes you may not know what disability someone has. For example, you would look at me, as you saw in our picture or potentially when we did share, um, that you would never guess that I have a disability that affects my mobility. Additionally, while we may include a question in our instruction request about whether students need accommodations, but sometimes professors will say yes and not give details, they may not realize accommodations are needed because students, especially with invisible disabilities, may not be revealing their conditions or they may not see that answer at all and skip it. Together, never rely on that. Instead of designing your instruction in such a way that you eliminate as many barriers as possible, and you're being willing to adapt on the fly, you can prevent all of these problems. Remember that what you see might not be the whole story. This picture does a great job of showing that what is visible on the surface and what is invisible, unseen, below the surface can affect the daily life of a person more than the things that are unseen. Students may need accommodations for the things you can't see, so never assume by the looks of a student that they don't need an accommodation, and instead be prepared for anything. So this quote, universal design and education creates an educational environment that is not just inclusive of students with disabilities, but all students. This quote does a great job of of explaining my favorite part about UDL, which I wanted to share with you before we dive deep into what makes up UDL, is that this, all of the changes that you will make with UDL are not just good for people with disabilities, but they're good for all students who may learn differently. So now let's get into what is UDL and why is it important? So there are numerous different definitions of what makes of UDL that we could reference, but this one is my favorite because it breaks it down well. Universal design for learning includes flexibility and in how information is shared, student engagement, and student knowledge and skills. Also, it includes reducing barriers in instruction, accommodations, support, and challenges. And it helps to maintain high achievement expectations for all students, not just students with disabilities. It is also often known as a framework for creating educational goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone and includes flexible approaches that can be customized and adjusted to meet the needs of individual students. The overall idea is that by incorporating the different elements that we will discuss in a minute, you can alleviate some of the required accommodations that students may need because, students, because the students' learning needs are already being included in the design of your library instruction. This definition is followed by the three elements that make up UDL. The three principles are multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression, and multiple means of engagement. Multiple means of representation addresses the need to present information in a variety of ways in order to accommodate learners who may have visual or auditory impairments or different learning styles. The principle of action and expression is that there is a need for different learning activities that make sense to students and are meaningful to them. Engagement is that you can appeal to all students so that they remain motivated and engaged through different forms of active learning. Some people say that the best way to do this is through technology, but both Christina and I think that there's many different ways that you can incorporate this and we're going to walk you through that. So there are seven core components of UDL. 
We've taken them and adapted the typical general education examples to have a library instruction twist. We're going to go through all seven of them and we've got a chart of them plus our library related examples in the Google folder that we showed you earlier. And if you can't access that, feel free to email us and we'll happily share it with you. So here we have each core component and its definition and then the library related example that come, we came up with. Some of the examples are a little more general while others are very specific. I encourage you to think about your own instruction as we go through these and see if you could make small adjustments here or there to incorporate some of these core components and please put those in the chat. So the first one is equitable use, which is making your lesson applicable and appealing to all users. So for example, if you use slides during library instruction, provide a Google Doc or a printout of your slides or your notes so students can follow along at whatever pace they need to. Second, we have flexibility in use. Make your lesson plan flexible to accommodate a wide range of abilities. For example, use a variety of instruction methods, slides, lecture, group activities, polling, etc. Provide different styles of learning for the students. Then it, is, it should be simple and intuitive. So be straightforward and predictable. Do not add unnecessary complexity, which I am so guilty of sometimes. I bet a lot of you are too. So for example, when breaking students into groups, provide clear instructions, written and verbal, and examples of what you want the students to do. There's really no need to overcomplicate things. The next is perceptible information. In an effective manner, provide all necessary information to students. An example of this is if you talk about databases throughout your instruction, provide students with a list of resources, written and digital, and links to what you're discussing. So that way they can go back to those at the end of the lesson. Then we have tolerance for error. Understand that every student learns at a different pace and has different skills. So for example, before asking a student to demonstrate database searching in front of the class, make sure they uh, understand the exercise and that they're comfortable presenting. If they don't understand, try to meet with them after class or schedule a consult to continue helping the students so that they get you know, the full experience and understand fully what you were asking them to do. Next, we have low physical effort, which is instruction is designed to minimize physical effort for learning. All students, allow students to type answers to group activities, if you are having them fill out a worksheet, allow students to choose whether to handwrite or type answers and provide both physical and digital copies. And then we have size and space for approach and use. Um, understand that every student learns at a different pace and has different skills. So one example of this could be when doing an activity that requires movement to signal participation, such as a Boolean operator activity that I really like to do uh, that does involve movement, um, allow students to maybe raise their hands or say I or give an alternative form of, you know, indication, not just the option to stand up. This gives them a choice instead of forcing one particular type of participation. And we did have a question in the chat about the Google Doc and we should have, that link there should take you to, uh, to the Google folder. All right, moving on. So next, we wanted to talk about our different views and experiences with UDL. As I have talked about a little bit, I have an invisible disability, so I've been conscious of this throughout my education for a long time. There have been times where somebody wanted me to get up and do a physical activity where I couldn't, and I looked like either a bad person or like I didn't want to participate, or then I had to make a big deal out of it. And so because of that, I have worked to include accessible elements in my teaching for years, whether it's a presentation that I do for class or the classes that I've taught myself. And so that's been important to me, but now I'm really working to deliberately use UDL in my library instruction. So for example, as I'm prepping for the spring semester, I'm making sure to prep all of my lesson plans to include all of these elements and think through the activities that I normally do to make sure I'm making them as accessible as possible. And then um, I, Christina, as someone who does not have uh, any sort of disability, the, the concept of UDL was pretty new to me. Um, I certainly knew about accessibility in libraries, but my knowledge was limited mostly to technology and services, and I never really, you know, associated teaching with that as well. 
But um, Sammy introduced me to this topic a little while back, and I was actually kind of pleased to discover that, you know, some of the things that I already do in my lessons regularly um, are in line with some of these UDL core components. But I also discovered some major changes that I need to make, and I'm now working to do that. So I'm also working to be a really good ally for students and my coworkers who have disabilities. And like Sammy, I'm trying to be a lot more deliberate now and uh, actively incorporate UDL into my lesson plans for this spring um, and then take that forward. I want it to really become just sort of the normal way that I do things. So how does UDL relate to library instruction? We've sort of circled around this a little bit, but now we're gonna dive in a little deeper. So UDL is based on the idea uh, that our best education practices are not necessarily one size fits all. So what works best for one student doesn't necessarily uh, work best for the next one, regardless of whether they have a disability. The same should go for our library instruction and we should aspire to make our instruction inclusive to as many students as possible. And in fact, we probably already do a lot of UDL things in our instruction without really knowing it because it is very much in line with how libraries tend to view and practice diversity and inclusion. So we're a little ahead of the game and that's great. Um, there are definitely some barriers and then, you know, various benefits to using UDL in library instruction. So one of the biggest that, that we see is hesitation. Um, librarians being hesitant to change the way they do things. So even if they're already unintentionally incorporating some UDL techniques, it can be a challenge to convince someone to incorporate uh, these things that sound new and different um, because change can be scary or maybe they're just really comfortable with what they already do or they just don't want to take the time to go back and change the lesson plans that they do every single year. So some might ask, why bother uh, going to the extra effort to incorporate UDL if we're if we just do a lot of one-shot instruction. Well, all students deserve instructors who are considerate of different learning needs, styles, and abilities, and that includes us as librarians. So think back to our statistics. Um, in 2011-2012, about 11% of students at universities had a disability, and we know that this is growing. Um, so that means that it's very likely you have encountered a student with a disability in your instruction, even if you didn't know it. Um, as we saw, on our, our polling, um, you know, majority of you indicated that you had not had an accommodation request, but just because you don't get a request doesn't mean accommodations aren't necessary. So we should be incorporating UDL into any kind of instruction we do, not just the one shot. So for instance, if we make a libguide or something similar, we should try to consider a variety of ways to convey the information in there. If we are embedded in a course, we should consider as many delivery methods as we can. And sometimes this means getting really creative, uh, especially if you're not face-to-face -face with students. Um, if you do an instruction session via Zoom, that's a whole nother thing. And we should definitely be mindful of the limitations of online environments and absolutely incorporate UDL into the session to enhance learning for all students, not just the ones with disabilities. Because being inclusive is incredibly important. Uh, being thoughtful and mindful of all students will make a bigger difference than you know. And as we've talked about, UDL just doesn't help benefit everyone with disabilities. It can benefit everyone in the classroom. And it really just comes down to making some simple changes. It doesn't have to be hard. And in fact, like me, you probably already might be using some of these principles without fully knowing you know, what you're doing. So now we can be more mindful. So there are five ways to incorporate universal design in teaching. And there is something that I want to bring up that somebody commented. The amazing thing about UDL is if you incorporate in your teaching before you have an accommodation request, it eliminates most of the need for accommodation requests. That's the great thing about it. So there are five different ways to incorporate it. The first is share with text, aka you can build multiple pathways. By scripting out your topics last lesson, you can find areas where you may ramble. This can be recorded in audio format as well that you can share with your students. We, we also do this in some ways by creating libguides that follow along with our lessons. Or for example, I always share my slides with students. If you give them multiple opportunities to see the information slash text, it can be very helpful. 
but this could also just be as simple as practicing your lessons, which we all pretty much do anyway. The second is create alternatives. For example, um, you can create two, three, four versions of text, and we've done it in this lesson, um, in this presentation. We have provided you with access to our slides and outline, and then gave you all a place to take group notes if you want to. This allows people to take notes or follow along in different ways. A common thing I suggest to instructors here at the University of Wyoming is to have a group note taking. One instructor will be allowing students to volunteer to take notes that will be shared with the rest of the class and give those students participation points, things like that. And this allows students who have trouble taking notes and following along to be as successful as other students. It's a simple change, but it can make a big difference. The next is to let them do it their way. Allow students to select their own way of doing an activity or project. A larger example of this is for the classroom, but you can allow students to present things in a different way for a final project. For example, a paper, a video, presentation, etc. But it could also be finding a finding resources activity that I use in my instruction and allowing students to choose to do this in a group or by themselves. The next is go step by step. Break what you are doing into groups, units, or phases. This can be as simple as how you design your library instruction and guide them through the process of finding resources step by step and making sure students understand what you're teaching them to do, which we all do anyway. The last is to set content free. Use tools that are accessible and easy for faculty and students to learn. Create a screen capture video of a tutorial, add alt text to photographs like we've done in our presentations. If you use PowerPoint in your library instruction, make sure you provide students with the files or an outline of what you would discuss with links and our resources for them to go back to. As we've said, UDL has been proven to improve learning and more accurately assess student knowledge. It allows for flexibility instructions. Often we're using it without realizing it and it removes the need for accommodation and it's great. It's not just helpful for people with disabilities. It's helpful for all students who may learn differently. All right. So we're going to move into our discussion. We've got about half an hour left. Um, so we're going to start with this question that you see here. After this, we have some scenarios that we're going to present to you coupled with general discussion questions. So you can kind of choose how you would like to respond and engage. Um, and hopefully this is going to spark a nice lively discussion and people can get some new ideas. And yeah, Elizabeth, I really like the note taker idea too. That's great. I hate taking notes. So that would be nice. Um, and also please remember, um, we've got a lot of people here today. Um, so we are not gonna be able to get to all questions or comments in the chat. If you do have a question or comment that you would like us to address after the session, uh, or if you wanna continue the discussion with us individually, our emails are over here on the left side of the screen and we have the hashtag uh, for Twitter as well, uh, hashtag UDL in libraries. So if you want to continue that discussion on Twitter, that would be pretty cool. So let's discuss. Have you ever had to accommodate a student disability on the fly in a library instruction session? Were you caught off guard or did you feel prepared to make the necessary accommodations? So uh, feel free to type your responses in the chat, do make sure that that little blue thing right above where you type your message says all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see what's in the chat. So we'll give you a little bit here. And yeah, it, you know, some of us have been doing this for a long time and maybe we don't remember, but um, if anyone has a unique situation, we'd love to hear about it. Um, yeah, Kathy says, yes, I realized that a sight impaired student would not be able to see the PowerPoint across the room. I had a handout so he could read it. And Kathy, did you have that handout before class ready or did you have to go print it on the fly? Before class, excellent. And yeah, unfortunately, Zoom doesn't show us if people are typing or not. So <laughs> um, let's see. Christy says, I once had a student who had a head injury and had trouble with the fluorescent lights. Um, I had trouble with this because all the lights in the building were fluorescent and I didn't know what to do. 
and something like that can be really difficult because we don't have much control over some of our facilities in that regard. So that one can be very difficult. Uh, let's see. Wow, you guys are sending them in like crazy now. <laughs> it's hard to focus on one. Yes. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> They're coming so fast. So it looks like we've got a good mix of experiences here. Um, and just so you know, we are gonna be copying and pasting the chat. So if you wanna go back later, I believe that'll be posted on the ACRL instruction section website um, if we wanna look at these. So um, yeah, let's see, Natalie here says, a student was in a wheelchair that couldn't fit under the standard desk. Luckily she uh, knew to get a get to class a few minutes early and luckily we had an adjustable desk, but I had to find our operations manager to show me how to use it. So, it's one nice thing about librarians is we're pretty resourceful, so. One person said that an instructor asked them not to call on a particular student during class and they weren't sure why, but you never know what that accessibility thing could have been. Yeah, sometimes it, it's really hard to judge how many questions you can or should ask. So, um, yeah. wearing a special microphone for hearing impaired student. We were talking to one of our colleagues this morning and he had that exact same thing happen. Um, and he said he didn't even think that wearing a microphone could be considered an accommodation request. So. Yeah, and sometimes, Erin, the instructors aren't helpful or they may not understand what accommodations are exactly needed because they may teach differently than you, they may not do activities in class, so the student may not have told them that they need an accommodation for that. So sometimes they don't know either. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I love where this discussion is going, but we're gonna move on to our first scenario and our second discussion question, just so we can get through them all, but please keep your comments coming. Um, so our first scenario deals with visual impairment, and I actually saw somebody comment, I think almost on this exact situation. Um, so the situation, a student arrives for an instruction ses ses <laughs> session and informs you that they will need to use a screen reader or similar, but you were not aware of this prior to the session. How would you respond? Do you know what kind of assistive technologies your library has to help students with visual impairments? So you can think about that scenario. Then we also have a discussion question to go with this. How does your library accommodate student disabilities? Could you use any of the assistive technologies or policies your library has for patrons and use or apply them to your instruction? So for example, here um, at the University of Wyoming, we have iPods that students can check out that have screen readers built into them. So you could always go run and grab that and use that. If you had a worksheet and not a digital version for a student, there's many different ways. Yeah, the, the thing here at the University of Wyoming, which actually I just learned today about our iPods with screen readers is you have to have a paper copy. So if you've already incorporated some UDL into your session and provided either an outline or a physical copy of the slides or the worksheets, that would be one way for a student with a visual impairment to be able to follow along at relatively the same pace as students who don't need that assistive technology. So let's see. Yeah, some colleges are, are pretty behind in this, but, you know, change can come from the library and it really often does. We can be amazing advocates for a lot of these greater changes that, that our, our institutions need to make. Let's see. So we have mics built into our classrooms, Stephen, but they aren't perfect for people who have hearing because they won't connect with theirs. So students usually do bring their own technology for that circumstance. Mm -hmm. And Douglas says he thinks that their laptops have screen readers built in, which would be so cool if it does. Um, that would be really nice. But yeah, a lot, of, a lot of it comes down to figuring out what the technology is and how do you use it. Like I said, I just learned today that it has to be a paper copy for our iPods. So I'm gonna have to look into some of that. Martha, your library sounds awesome. Yeah, it really does. That's very cool. And yes, even uh, university accessibility plans are great. And um, yeah, every classroom to have accessible tech, that's wonderful. Uh, and I'm glad it includes your library rooms too. So, so that's really good. <laughs> yeah, Martha, you're very, very lucky indeed. 
All right. Caitlin, that's awesome that you're making presentations ADA compliant. It's just an easy change that you can do and it solves a problem before an accommodation comes up. Mm -hmm. Which again is really in line with a lot of what UDL uh, advocates for is sort of stopping the problem before it starts. Uh, you know, really coming into a new way of designing instruction. So, all right. I think we're ready to move on to scenario number two. All right, so scenario number two deals with trouble with movement. So the situation, your lesson plan for the instruction session you're teaching today has the students getting up and moving around the classroom quite a bit. <clears throat> As you explain this to the class, one of the students looks uncomfortable and a little upset. The instructor did not indicate on the instruction request form that any of their students needed a disability accommodation, but you wonder if the student might have a movement limitation and you don't wanna single them out and ask if they need accommodation. Um, what could you do to adjust your activities without making it too obvious that you're trying to accommodate? How could you reimagine an activity that is movement heavy for the future to be more inclusive and utilize UDL principles? So if you want to respond to that, you can. Otherwise, our general discussion question is, where could you make some changes to your instruction pedagogy and activities that would make them more inclusive? Are they big changes or small changes? Do you think you could maintain these changes to make your future instruction accessible to all? So we'll give you a minute to think on that and type. Oh, on the fly, I might have that student help me administer the activity if that can be done while sitting down. That's good. That's a great idea. Yeah. Put them in groups, choose a representative to move. That's a great idea too. Because especially me, Christina, coming from someone who doesn't have a disability and doesn't have movement limitations, it can be a real mindset shift to start thinking about these things. Whereas, you know, Sammy, like she mentioned, has dealt with this her whole life. So, Anne, you said, like, what if a change you make makes the activity accessible to one but inaccessible to another? Hopefully, a change you wouldn't be making would ruin the activity for everybody. But like Natalie and Aaron did, they just adjusted the activity a little bit. So students weren't getting up and walking around everyone, but one was, and so that way a student who has a disability can still participate, but doesn't necessarily have to get up to go right on the board. Yeah. You just want to make those changes in a way that they're not making it inaccessible to another, but makes it accessible for everyone. The choice is really important um, and giving those choices in a considerate way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially asking about accommodation needs when planning sessions, kind of like we mentioned, it, it can be difficult to sometimes get that information from the professors. Sometimes there are confidentiality things, sometimes they're not really allowed to share. Um, so I, it's really good to work with your Office of Disability Services or whatever equivalent office you have so that you can understand what you can ask and what you can't ask. Um, but again, UDL, if, if you just start incorporating all of these things, it kind of just you know cuts it off at the start and one example we have is we include a question in our instruction requests about whether any accommodations are needed and there's been many times where instructors say no but then a student comes in who needs an accommodation so mm -hmm. i think sometimes they just don't see that question anyway it, often they leave it blank yeah. at our university so either they don't know how to answer it they either maybe don't see it or they just i don't know I don't know what they're thinking sometimes. Yeah, I like your idea about having movable whiteboards instead of having to get up and move the whiteboards so that way somebody can sit down while doing it. Yeah. It's a great idea. If you have that equipment, that's an excellent solution to a problem like that. So, and yeah, Judy, it really kind of goes institution to institution what um, student services are allowed to share with professors, mm -hmm. what professors are allowed to share with others. So, and yeah, that, that could very well be a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And here they share what accommodations are needed, but it's up to the student whether they want to share what their disability is and give that background to the instructor. So the instructor may just know that there is an accommodation, but not why, and have no background understanding. So sometimes it's not their fault either. They may not know. And that's what I was talking about with invisible disabilities is it's really hard to know. And that's what makes UDL so great is that you're preventing any problems 
in advance for those students who you may not realize have a disability. Yeah, and Kate, thank you for that Amazon link. Um, yeah. yeah, individual whiteboards are pretty cheap and can be a nice little investment. Um, and then Kenneth here is talking about smart boards um, so they can get a printed copy of whatever's on the board. That would be pretty cool. You could um, take pictures too though and send mm -hmm. those out. Yeah, and uh, one thing that our instruction rooms here allow is we can uh, cast to the screen from the laptops or from an iPad or something. So that can sometimes be a way to let students work in groups. And then instead of asking people to come up to like the main podium and do things, they can cast right from where they're seated. So yeah, Julie, you mentioned privacy issues. Um, again, you always wanna check with, with your institution. Um, and see what what you can and can't do. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. Our question just asks whether there is an accommodation needed and what that accommodation is. We don't ask who the student is. We don't want to know. Yeah. We just want to be prepared for the accommodation. Like I, I had one come in uh, for a session in February, and they indicated that they needed a room that could be wheelchair accessible. So I picked our instruction room with a height adjustable desk, and um, we'll see what happens when we get there. All right. I think uh, we're about ready to move on to our third scenario. So our third scenario deals with disruptions. So the situation, a uh, student in your instruction session is constantly interrupting and distracting other students and the professor is not present to help intervene because sometimes the professors don't come to our library sessions. Uh, after trying to keep the student on track a few times, it dawns on you that the student may have a learning disability and that is why they're being so disruptive. You don't want to single anyone out and you definitely don't want to assume. Uh, so you try to think quickly about how to keep the student engaged while not ignoring any of the other students. So what could you do? So you, you can think about that if you want. And then our general discussion question is, what are some small changes? Oops. <laughs> what are some small changes that you can make tomorrow to the way you teach to incorporate UDL? Oh, Bridget, I like that they're required to attend your sessions. That's nice. We try to force that here too. Yeah, sometimes I've had one professor show up and then step out to take a phone call the whole class, so. Yeah, or I, say they're going to show up and then not show up. It'd be a struggle. But yeah, what, what would you do in a situation like this? Has anybody encountered this or? You know, th this one I feel like is a little more abstract than some of the others. Um, but yeah, active learning could be a great way to keep someone engaged. Um, our thought with this situation is that maybe it may be um, ADD or something similar. And my thought was, you know, try and get this student who's being disruptive to come up there and, and help you teach have them help you run the session uh, could be a way to do it. Well, and in some of the previous ones, they talked about how somebody um, had a panic attack and the instructor didn't know how to handle the situation. Mm -hmm. So the instructor could still be there and not know to how to handle the situation. So if the instructor is there and not helping, what would you do? Yeah. Sometimes standing near them can calm them down. Mm -hmm. uh, peer work as, um, as we see here. Uh, sometimes, yeah, if, if a student is disruptive or having trouble focusing, putting them in smaller groups of people can be good. Um, Judy says, give the student a challenge to find something specific while you continue with the instruction for the rest of the class, kind of like a, a race the librarian challenge. I like that. I think in a certain situation that could work really well. So, but um, let's think about the general question. So, just think about your own instruction. What, what small changes could you do if you had a session tomorrow? For those of you who are already in session, we don't start till the 28th, so. <laughs> yeah, Val Again, validate the student. Yeah. yeah, that's good. You guys have some great ideas. Yeah, asking about accommodation needs ahead of time. Um, yeah, and you know, if, if you correspond with the instructor before the session, you could ask that question again, even if it duplicates what's on the form. 
uh, print copies of everything. Uh, for me personally, I actually, I love the outline that Sammy put together for our presentation. And I think I'm going to try and do that for my instruction sessions so that they can go back and see exactly what I talked about. Uh, I would have loved it if my professors did that for me in all of my programs. And yeah, send the PowerPoint to the professor before class. Um, excellent guided, guided notes. notes. And yeah, I think I'm going to try the collaborative note taking this semester as well. Um, I've been to a few conferences that do that and I really like it. Yeah, handouts sometimes do get left behind. It can feel like a waste of paper. I really do like doing things digitally, but um, in our research for this presentation, it really made me think about, you know, for some people, handwriting is a better way for them to learn. <laughs> for me, it's typing. I hate handwriting things. I need to type everything. So Bridget, you could provide say bring 10 printed out versions and then email the outline and then that way you're not printing out 30 for the whole class but having some for students who do want to take it and then a digital version for students who want that so you could provide both to kind of meet everybody in the middle mm -hmm. yeah really offering multiple formats is really important um, guided notes could be sort of like that outline that we've provided that delves a little deeper into what you're talking about. Um, if anyone else has a, a better sort of explanation of guided notes, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, but that, that's what it means to me. And instead of printing, you can send a digital version of a handout and then if students do want it printed, they can print it themselves if your institution is asking you to do less printing. Um, very good. Okay, we're going to move on to our final discussion question and then our, our end polling because we've, we've got about 12 minutes left. So our final discussion question takes this a little bit big picture. And we really want to know what do you see as the biggest barriers to incorporating UDL into library instruction? And are these barriers something that you think you can overcome? So think on that for a second. We'll give you a minute to type. Time. Yes, time is a big one, but if you make the initial investment, it's going to serve you for a very long time. Yeah, budget, university culture. Notice um, before class, but if you implement this into just the way that you teach in general, then you don't even need notice. Well, unless they I, are asking you like 10 minutes before, but yeah. then we're all doing it on the fly anyway. Yeah. There are so many different types of disabilities. That is true. And UDL isn't going to cover everything. But what it does is it sets you ahead of the game. There's still going to be accommodations for students who are hard of hearing or who are um, have vision issues, things like that. But by implementing this, you can kind of put yourself so you're in a good situation to jump into those things too. Mm -hmm. And someone mentioned money and a few people have mentioned funding for purchasing specialized equipment. And that definitely can be a barrier and maybe not one that, that you're in the position to overcome. But incorporating a lot of these UDL core elements um, can sort of eliminate some of those technologies, not all of them, that's for sure. But it certainly can ease the burden for those who, who learn differently. And yeah, knowledge, what to do and when. Um, that's, I think that's often a barrier for many of us. But the good thing is there are a lot of resources out there. Um, we did put uh, a brief reading list on uh, the ACRL instruction section blog. Um, and if you are interested in further reading, you can contact us and we'll, we'll send you a bunch of stuff. We got a whole Zotero library about it. Yeah, and sometimes you don't have the university support. We're lucky here that we have a group that is working to implement UDL in their classes too. So we have their support as well. So it creates, we can make our Zotero library public if that would be helpful to everybody. Yeah, we, we can do that and um, we'll include it. We'll, we'll, we'll get one of the um, committee members to put it up on the, the blog post. So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, but yeah, we, we are really lucky here that we have a lot of support for UDL. We have a whole task force working on it um, with our instructors, which is great. 
So, okay. Um, let's move on. We have just a couple minutes left. And in case you guys have any questions for us, we want just a minute or two for that. So we're gonna go back to our polling. So if you still have that Menti screen up, please go back to that. And we're gonna move to our next question. So now that you know more about UDL, have you ever used it in your instruction? Yes. I think a lot of people exactly. have, this is awesome. That's so great. That's what we like to see. And if you haven't, that's okay too. Now you know, and you can, you know, if you choose, start thinking about these things. Excellent. Very good. I'll give you about 20 more seconds to send in your answer if you want. And remember, you just have to go to www.menti.com and use the code 56625, and it should give you access. All right, cool. So you all, in, a lot of you are in the same boat that I was in. I was doing these things and not even realizing it. And now that I know, I can do them better and intentionally. All right, so we're gonna to go to our last poll question. So we wanna know what comes to mind now after 50 minutes of discussing this when you think of library instruction and accessibility. So you can go ahead and send in those words. Um, possible. Oh, these oh, make me happy. You're making our hearts so big. Doable, yes. It's absolutely doable. And it's a lot easier than we thought. Um, and Martha, the Zotero library, we haven't posted that yet. We have to go in um, to our settings and make that public, which we will do after the session. Oh, you guys, this is great. Remember, you can send in up to about 10 words, and you can send in a word that's already been sent in before, if you want. And like we said, um, we're going to take screenshots of the two word clouds and we are going to put them on Twitter. And so follow us on Twitter and please start a conversation with us on Twitter. We're gonna yeah. try to start some conversations with people. And if people are interested in learning more about this, yeah, again, we're happy to talk and chat. Um, we're also doing a uh, workshop about this at LOEX in May. So we're gonna be focusing on invisible disabilities in UDL specifically, but we'll be uh, actually looking at some lesson plans and looking where we can make changes and practicing. So if you're interested and you're gonna be there, could be some good hands-on stuff. Makes me really happy that the biggest words are possible, doable, and inclusion. With That's helpful and necessary following and first behind. Yeah. That's wonderful. Great. Thanks, Is this word cloud accessible? We will post the screenshots in that Google folder we shared with everybody um, mm -hmm. as well, so you can access these. Yeah. And there's a lot of polling software out there. I like Menti because it looks pretty. Um, Poll Everywhere might be a little more accessible in terms of its layout, design, and color choices. Um, but sometimes you just want something really pretty. So, okay. So we'll flip back here real quick. Um, that's all the content that we have. We do have um, about six minutes left. If you guys have any questions or things you wanna talk about, um, feel free to put it in the chat. And if you guys can't access the Google Drive, please email us, we'll happily send it to you. Here's our emails again. Yeah, and Judy, we'll try and change those colors. Um, yeah, I, I found it a little difficult to look Me at too. too. So. You could walk the student through, Lori, what you're doing and describe what you're talking about because a screen reader won't necessarily read everything and it can sometimes get a little overwhelming because I don't know if you guys have ever tried to use a screen reader. It's actually really helpful so you can understand. Most computers have a basic one installed, so I would suggest trying it just so you could see what it looks like for a student, but it can get overwhelming for a website. Mm -hmm. And so just walk students through what you're doing. Describe what the website looks like and just be as descriptive as possible. That's going to be better than what a screen reader can do. Yeah. And what you can also do is offer to meet with that student one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, if they're having a really hard time with it, 
offer a consult session where you can sit down together and they could maybe ask you some specific questions about what things look like or how they're formatted or use the screen reader together. And it, it takes more time, but it's considerate and it would certainly be appreciated. And it's worth it in the end. Anybody else have any questions? Or anything they want to share? Agreed, Kenneth. We, both Christina and I have Macs, and the Mac one is very useless, but there are, are a lot of free apps and tools that you can use and download that are really good, and I honestly would really suggest using it. It gives you a great experience of understanding what students who use screen readers go through. And thank you guys. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, textbooks for sight impaired students. So what we do here is we partner with um, our disability support services and provide ebooks or PDFs that implement into um, their screen readers. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And um, yeah, I think that's what we got. Great. Thank you so much, Sammy and Christina, for that presentation. And thank you, everybody, for participating this afternoon in the forum. Um, just a reminder to follow up directly with our presenters if you have any specific questions. Uh, we also have, on behalf of the discussion group steering committee, we have a um, feedback forum that I'm going to put in the chat now. So if you are have a moment, we'd really appreciate any feedback on this presentation. Um, but once again, thank you everybody. And, and by registering, you should receive a link with a recording for this presentation so that you can watch it again later. This one.